likes the rule bending stories because I sure do. I love these kinds of stories because they're the ones where I get to do all the research on a specific car and how it was designed and how it was built and look at the ways they cleverly got around the rule book because things today they're a little bit different aren't they? Back in the 60s, 70s, 80s the other teams would scramble to copy what another team had done. Nowadays it's I didn't think of that and I want it banned. A few months ago, I sat down with Peter Brook on his podcast to talk about Lauda vs Hunt and also the Super Aguri team, and we both agreed that getting VIP tickets to a Grand Prix isn't the sort of thing that we'd want out of this whole YouTube thing. We would very much prefer to sit down with somebody that worked for Footwork back in 1992 or one of the struggling to pre-qualify teams from the 80s and hear stories about how they were calling the cops on other teams and claiming they were smuggling heroin into Luxembourg on their way over to the German Grand Prix. Stuff like that. Not so much illegal things in terms of the Formula 1 rulebook, but actual illegal stuff. The stuff that just would not happen today. That's the stuff I live for, for this kind of thing. But the controversial stuff is what generates the discussion, because there's always these questions of who knew, who didn't know, who was in on it, who wasn't in on it, who's lying, who's telling the truth, that kind of thing. Did Alonso know about Crashgate? Was Hiref 1997 a premeditated thing by the Michael? Was Hamilton involved in Spygate? Was the 1976 Italian Grand Prix 8 find any excuse to give Lauda the edge and so on? Oh, and the Option 13 stuff, which is by far my favourite of all the controversial happenings, because we will never know what's going on. But one that came to me recently, and when I tell you what year it happened, you'll go, of course it was. And when I tell you who owned the team at this point, you'll go, of course it was. It's the story of Brabham's 1983 season, where for a time the car was powered by something called rocket fuel. But not actual rocket fuel, for reasons we'll get to later on. For this, we have to go back a little bit before 1983 to 1977, when Renault brought the first turbocharged engine onto the Formula 1 grid. The car was unreliable, but the Renault car company persisted with the technology to get things working. Over time, the engine got lighter, stronger, and was beginning to withstand the strains of a Grand Prix. Sure, supercharged engines had been used on World War II fighters and bombers and for a little bit of time in the 1950s, but using turbochargers in a 1.5 litre engine was uncharted territory, especially when it had to do what an F1 car does. This was all covered in a video recently, so I won't bore you with any of the details, but Renault kind of did all the heavy lifting in Formula 1 while the other engine manufacturers just watched. Outside of Formula 1, other companies were doing their own research, so by the time we get around to 1982 or so, the other engine manufacturers were able to introduce a turbocharged engine of their own and go racing. And somehow, they were more reliable than the ones that Renault had. In 1982, four teams ran a turbo engine, Brabham, Ferrari, Tolman and Renault. In 1983, more teams were making the switch, with most of the teams migrating over by the end of the 1983 season, with only Tyrrell being a naturally aspirated engine user by the start of 1984. Also in 1983, Ground Effect had now been banned. Turbo engines increasing in power, along with the deaths of Gilles Villeneuve, Riccardo Paletti and the career-ending crash of Didier Peroni, made the FIA make changes to the cars that required them to have totally flat floors, with the minimum weight being jacked up to account for the heavy turbos. So with Ground Effect now banned, Brabham was in a bit of a pickle. The BT-51 had been designed, built and was now ready to go. So Bernie Eccleston ordered the car to be scrapped and it was completely destroyed. There's no record of it anywhere, at least, that I can find. And Gordon Murray, who was the technical director of the team at that time, had to go back to the drawing board because he now had to design a new car very, very quickly because that BT-51 was illegal because the rules had changed. The result was this, the BT-52. With ground effect being gone, the side pods were generating lift rather than suction, so Murray had to go to some sort of extreme to try and bring it all down. The result was a dart-shaped car that had angular side pods that gave the car an aggressive and very 80s shape when looked at from the top-down view. Murray also designed a massive rear wing to produce a lot of rear downforce and also moved as much of the weight back as he possibly could to increase traction. Remember, back in these days, the turbo-powered cars suffered from horrendous turbo lag. So what is turbo lag? It's basically when you put your foot down in a turbo-powered car, the turbo will take a bit of time to spool up and kick in. Turbo lag means you have nothing, 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 everything, and then you have to figure out what the hell is going on. Anyone that's driven the Lotus 98T in a set of Corsa when it's cranked up to maximum boost can probably confirm. These days, cars will tend to have turbos that are connected to an electric motor that will keep them spinning up rather than having the exhaust gases spin them up, so it's ready to go all the time. 
At the start of the hybrid era, Mercedes had worked out a clever way of doing things. Well, I say they'd worked out a clever way of doing things. It was actually the same way that the supercharger had been mounted to the Merlin engines on the Spitfires during World War II. Mercedes put the turbocharger at the back of the engine rather than at the front of the engine. So it meant the exhaust gases had less distance to travel. So when it's coupled up to an electronic spoolie uppy thing for the turbo, if that's even a word, it meant that the turbo lag was reduced even further. Okay, it's only going to be a small amount, but a small amount is a big amount in Formula One. The turnaround was completed in just six weeks. The car was designed and built in no time at all by F1 standards. It must have annoyed Murray a bit because at the time, Bernie Eccleston was not just the owner of Brabham, but was also the head of the Formula One Constructors Association, a union of the privateer teams that had just ended a long running spat with the sports governing body, FISA, as it was then known, and they were more biased towards the manufacturers. Bernie had told Murray to carry on with the ground effect BT51, confident that despite the calls to ban ground effect, it would still be in place for 1983. Basically, the reason the Fokker aligned teams were pushing to keep ground effect is because the manufacturers like Renault and Ferrari had switched to turbos, while most of the privateers like Williams, McLaren, Tyrrell and so on were still using the trusty Ford DFE, which was much cheaper. Ground effect, which the garageistas had been able to exploit so well, was their insurance policy against the turbos. That said, Brabham had a turbo. For 1983, it would be the BMW M12 engine that in 1983 was thought to be chucking out about 1200 horsepower, with it going up again for 1984 all the way up to 1986. Murray reasoned that with that much power, the car would need all the traction it could get, hence the already mentioned weight towards the rear. Sounds a lot like the Renault R25 I looked at recently, doesn't it? Because the car didn't need big boxy side pods that contained the Venturi tunnels, the side pods just had to hold the radiators, so Murray shifted them to be behind the driver. The car, as a result, had the longest wheelbase of any car on the grid, coming in at around 2.8 metres, and in turn carried a smaller fuel tank than everybody else because Brabham had started playing around with chucking in more fuel during the race, instead of just filling the car up to the top. Murray, Eccleston and everybody else at Brabham were certain that everybody else would copy their idea that they'd been playing with through 1982. It was faster for them to use less fuel, then use the lesser weight advantage to pull a gap and then pit for more fuel a bit later on. Brabham's refuelling system fired fuel into the tank at 5 bar of pressure and could fill up 30 gallons in about 3 seconds. Smaller tank means smaller car. Smaller car means better packaging. Better packaging means better aero. Better aero means faster car. One other thing that was pioneered on this particular car was that the entire rear end was modular. Because these 1200 horsepower engines were good for about 10 miles before being thrown out, Murray had designed the rear end to be able to be removed as one unit, and then each bit taken off and bolted on as required. And when it turned up to the season opener at Rio, it won. But the race wasn't without its controversy. What happened during this race is that Keki Rosberg, the defending champion and pole sitter, came into the pits and promptly caught fire. The fire was extinguished and he went on his way, only to be disqualified afterwards because he'd been pushed started once the fire had been put out, so he lost his second place at the end. Normally, everybody else is moved up a position as Rosberg was kicked out of the classified results, so PK ended the race with 9 points, but Lauda backwards wasn't moved up, so only 5 drivers got the points. But Brabham had got themselves a good handling car, despite the error adjustments not being what the others had given the simplicity of the front wing. Okay, all the front wings at the time were simple, at least by today's standards they were simple, but Brabham's was even simpler still. PK struggled for wins thereafter. He retired at the USGP West at Long Beach, but was then second behind Prost at Port Ricard. Another retirement came at Imola, but Prost stringing together some good results meant that by the time they reached Canada, Prost was leading the championship by just a single point ahead of PK, with Tombe third on 23, Rosberg fourth on 22, and Watson fifth on 15. Meanwhile, Patrese in the other car was really struggling and was getting all the bad luck with retirements. He only finished one race in the first half of the season, a 10th place at Long Beach with the BT52B coming in for the British Grand Prix at Silverstone. But with Prost picking up his wins, it meant that after the Austrian Grand Prix, Prost was 16 points ahead of PK, and it looked like the team that introduced the turbos to Formula 1 would be the ones to win the first turbo championship, at least for a driver. Because a driver's championship had not been won by a turbo car yet. But just before the German Grand Prix, Paul Rocher, who was the guy assigned by BMW to work with Brabham and sort of help with the engine side of things, had to make a few phone calls because the BMW engines had one particular problem that they needed to solve. The problem was called detonation. 
This is when any fuel left in the engine combusts after normal combustion is triggered by the spark plugs. Because of this, Brabham had to turn down the engines a little further than they would have otherwise wanted to, which resulted in a slower car. Brabham needed a fuel that wouldn't result in all of this detonation, basically. The fuel supplier for Brabham at this time was the German company Winterschall, a company that is the petrochemical division of BASF. Winterschall's fuels were sold under the ARAL brand, and then any fuels used for energy were done under the VEBA brand. While the rules at the time, much like they do now, say that fuel used in Formula 1 must be similar to the fuel you get from any pump in Europe, Rocher and Winterschall had managed to identify a gap in the rulebook that said, so long as the fuel doesn't exceed 102 octane, you're fine. So Rocher calls his guy at BASF and says, have you got anything that will give us more boost before this detonation sets in? His mate says, I think I've got something hiding out the back. How much you got? 200 litres? Yeah, that'll do. Now you might have read in certain parts of the internet online, it might have been parroted on Twitter, stuff to the effect of that Brabham was using Nazi rocket fuel that was once used in the V2 rockets that bombed London in the latter part of the war to give the car 1200 horsepower in the race. It never happened, but I can give you an explanation as to why that myth has been perpetuated. Nazi rocket fuel was something like 44% alcohol and the rest liquid oxygen, stuff that's never going to work in an internal combustion engine in a zillion years. By the time the early 80s rolled around, things were a bit up in the air. The Iran-Iraq war had put a strain on oil supply and cars in Europe were switching over to having catalytic converters, so fuel needed octane boosters to cover up the fact that petrol was now having less lead in it. BASF had done some research into all of this and found some stuff from the 30s that might help them out. An early patent was found that was filed in Germany in the 1930s for producing hydrocarbons from coal. Because of the Treaty of Versailles, which harmed Germany's ability to industrialise and later on the Second World War, where Germany got cut off from oil refineries in Romania, Germany had developed ways of developing fuels from coal instead. The primitive synthetic petrol was about 75 octane, which would have worked on the cars at the time, but for aviation purposes, they needed to bump it up a bit. They would add things like methanol, benzene, toluene, I think that's how it's pronounced, and other stuff, which was done by converting coal into metallurgical coke. And at the same time, acetone and nitrobenzene had been used in the Mercedes and Auto Union Grand Prix machines just before the war. It's a wonder how anybody was alive to tell the tale, because if it wasn't destroying your insides, it would probably melt your bones if you got it on you. But back then, health and safety was an afterthought. It was BASF, then part of IG Farben, that concocted these fuels for use in the Luftwaffe's planes during the war, which is probably where the myth comes from. Plus, I doubt that BASF would have had a barrel of 40-year-old aviation fuel just knocking about like that. But the truth is, the fuel used by Brabham and BMW in the latter part of the 1983 season shared only a small amount of the compounds that were used in Nazi aviation fuel, and the two fuels were not the same at all. But what is the case is that BMW was able to solve its detonation issue, because the fuel now had chemicals inside that can burn more rapidly. This creates more heat energy, which produces more power, and is more resistant to this detonation thing because, well, I'm just guessing here because I'm not an engineer, that it burned off so fast there was nothing left behind. I don't know what the exact recipe was, but when it was all mixed together, the fuel could burn as they needed it to without going over the research octane number or RON number, so the fuel was totally legal. But having uncovered an interview with the late Charlie Whiting, who worked for Brabham at the time, it was claimed that this fuel was evil, but they knew that it was totally legal. Herbie Blash, who also worked with the FIA after a time at Brabham, said that when they had this stuff, they had to give everybody the riot act and say, look, as tempting as it sounds, do not put this stuff in your car. A couple of people naturally did, and the fuel melted the pipes. One guy was pumping the fuel out of his tank and some splashed onto his watch, melting the rubber strap. Blash also accidentally swallowed some of this fuel, and he wonders how it didn't kill him. Reading online, the only estimate I have for the recipe is 20% petrol and 80% methyl benzene, and this stuff was expensive as well, about $300 a litre. A litre in 1983 money. Whiting claimed there was some other stuff in there too, but I don't know what's true and what's not anymore, given that so many people who worked for Brabham at that time have given differing accounts. But the fuel didn't give instant results. PK finished 13th in Germany with a problem with the fuel system, and then he was third at Austria. He then retired at the Dutch Grand Prix when Prost crashed into him. 
He later won the Italian and European Grand Prix, with Prost retiring at Monza and coming second at Brands, which helped Piquet claw the gap back in the driver's standings to just two points. At the final race of the season at Kyle Army, Prost's Renault grenaded itself on lap 35 while Piquet cruised to third, giving him his second driver's title and the first driver's title for a turbo-powered car. Ferrari took the Constructors' title thanks to Renault being Renault, and after the South African Grand Prix, Renault actually protested the fuel used by Brabham, but the protest was never upheld. I think it was actually withdrawn, probably because Renault and some of the other manufacturers were also putting money into their own superfuels. Brabham continued to use this so-called rocket fuel because it made the car faster rather than being actual rocket fuel, which also adds to the myth, I think, through 1984. In doing so, it allowed them and other teams like Ferrari, who were also going through a super fuel project with their fuel supplier, to crank up the turbos even further. Qualifying turbo boost shot up from 2.5 to 3 bar of boost to nearly 5.5 bar of boost in the space of a season and a bit, with it all culminating with the absolutely mesmerising power figures from 1986, by which point the FIA stepped in and started reducing the power figures as they phased the engines out, culminating with a full ban on turbos for 1989. But that spike in turbo pressures and power started with this car, because BMW needed a way of getting rid of the detonation problem. A side effect was that with the problem gone, they could crank the engine up, and the other teams had to do the same thing just to be competitive. It was a snowball effect, all part of the arms race that is Formula 1, and Brabham used this fuel as late as possible so the other teams didn't get wind of what they were doing and copy them. But without this car, those mental turbo years probably would never have happened, so Brabham solved one problem and created another problem, a problem that is looked at with great fondness. So then, a look at the time Brabham and BMW used a special blend fuel to win the 1983 Drivers' Championship. If this has been a fun look through the motorsport history books, then do like this video so I know a good job was done. And for more like this, get subscribed with that bell on so you never miss out on anything else to do around here. Massive thanks as ever go out to the fine bunch of lads over at Patreon for the continued support. And if you want to help support me at a more personal level, then a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and other bits and pieces you might want or need to know, as well as the affiliate links I have with Mixed Garage and the F1 store. There's also super thanks and memberships there too if you just want to buy me a coffee or have a Patreon alternative. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.